So thanks for joining. This is the deep learning in DiPy here in Meta session. I'm Jonathan, and together with a few colleagues, we will try to provide an overview of some of the most relevant concepts behind deep learning and show how it can be applied to neuro imaging tasks. The session is split into three parts. The first part will try to provide a light introduction to deep learning. And then we will have two application parts. The first one will try to provide examples on how deep learning can be applied to brain image segmentation tasks. And the second one will show examples about applying deep learning to brain image registration tasks for a total of around 40 minutes. So let's start with the introduction. The task in deep learning is to build a computational framework by assembling models into a possibly dynamic computational graph and training it to perform a task by optimizing the parameters, possibly using gradient-based methods. Deep learning has allowed to recalibrate the machine learning models where the way to build the system was by handcrafting a feature structure that basically constructed an appropriate representation of the raw input so that it could be digested by a learning algorithm. Deep learning has allowed to replace this by a cascade of modules, all of which are trainable end-to-end -end by using an optimization strategy. We can fit the system with the raw inputs and by appropriately designing the cascade of modules, these modules do not just learn to achieve the end goal, but also learn to produce appropriate internal representations and features to achieve it. So finding underlying patterns in the data and minimizing assumptions. And this can be used in a variety of learning paradigms, whether it is learning from annotated data that is using supervised method or non-annotated data that is using unsupervised methods, a combination of both or other paradigms. So rather than hard coding a set of rules or models for process, deep learning is a data-driven approach. So we collect a data set of images or other type of data on their corresponding labels. Then we use a deep learning approach to, tra to train a network that is to learn a function or its parameters on a given task. And then we evaluate the network or model on new images or new data. So deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. It is a mathematical framework for learning representations from data in a multi-stage way. So we use neural networks to share the gain insights. Then we share weights across the data at a layer so that we can reduce the number of parameters of the network. The architecture is a key component. And in fact, the search of new architectures is a very active field of research. Also, the amount of data required to train such large networks, as well as the high-end hardware needed, makes a distinction between deep learning and machine learning. From a few years now, deep learning is applied to a variety of tasks across different domains and different platforms. It can run on the largest supercomputers available or the smartphones that you are carrying around. So these are a few of the tasks where deep learning is being used. So in image classification, we get an image and we want to recognize what type of image it is, whether it, it is a plane, or it is a dog, a car, or whatever. In object detection, we will want to detect the objects that are contained in an image and hopefully be able to localize them within it. In semantic segmentation, rather than labeling the entire image with a single ca category, we want to understand the class of every pixel of the image. That is what a pixel means for a given purpose. And we can also think of activity recognition tasks or image caption tasks. Beyond the computer vision field, deep learning has made several bre breakthroughs in other tasks, such as regression or clustering. Deep learning methods also excel in a variety of other domains, such as those related to verbal and written communication. In tasks such as text or speech recognition or synthesis, synthesis or automatic translation. More recently, 
Deep learning has been applied to other research fields related to life sciences, such as genome or protein science. So which are the basic units of a deep learning model or network? Well, first we've got the input. It can have multiple raw data types concatenated. Then we've got the basic units called neurons, which are grouped into layers. Then we've got the weights, which weigh the importance of the inputs to a given neuron. They encode the relationships between parts. Then we've got the activation functions. And finally, we've got the outputs. The layer is an abstraction of a collection of inputs that allow to use vectorized implementations, which allow to train a network in a very fast way. The concept or neuron is one that is less and less present as the complexity of the networks increase or architectures evolve. Nevertheless, large efforts are being put into investigating whether parallels between neural networks and brains can have a theoretical background. Layers can be essentially of two main types. We've got the convolutional layers, which apply a filter to an input to create a feature map that summarizes the features present in the input data. The values of these filters are what is learned during the training process. We may have recurrent networks, which have a recurrent connection or loop on what is called a hidden state. Recurrent networks share parameters across different time steps, which ensures that sequential information in the input data is captured. So far for the feature extraction layers. But we also have feature selection layers, that is the pooling layers. These pooling layers make the representation smaller and more manageable and operate over each activation map independently. We may have max pooling layers. Here, the values within the receptive field of the kernel are maxed out. Or we may have average pooling layers, where the values within the receptive field of the kernel are averaged. And we may also find fully connected layers where, where all neurons or units have a particular connection to the downstream ones. All these can be summarized as the learning process of a network function, which can be understood as a composition of the transformations applied by each layer to the input data to obtain the value of interest at the output. I mentioned the activation functions. These activation functions introduce nonlinearities in the network. Learning a nonlinear function can allow to extract more interesting features from the input data. I'm just showing three, but there are many more. The first one uh, that is shown is the sigmoid, which squashes the numbers to the zero to one range. It's historically been popular since they've got nice interpretation as the saturating firing rate of a neuron, but they've got their own problems. Saturating neurons kill the gradients, and the sigmoid outputs are not zero-centered. Then we've got the tonnage, which squashes inputs to the minus one one brains, and which are zero-centered, which is nice, but still, they kill the gradients when saturated. And then we've got really, which does not saturate in the positive region. It's also very computationally efficient and converges much faster than sigmoid tonnage in practice. And others have been proposed and in fact are being proposed due to the particular properties. So who does a deep learning network work? How does it achieve its goal? Well, it achieves its goal through optimization. That is, we need to come up with a way of efficiently finding the parameters that minimize the loss function. The graph in deep learning is defined dynamically by input dependent programs. That is, they use differentiable functions or programming to optimize an objective function that leads to achieve the underlying objective or task. So this is an iterative process that consists of two steps. First one is the forward pass, where we compute uh, the last function and save the intermediate needed 
for the grading computation. And then we've got the backward graphs, where we recursively apply the differentiation to compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to the weights or the parameters along the computational graph. That is, we need to know how the parameters have to change to get closer to the targets. The loss function tells how good our model is. That is, it quantifies our unhappiness with a score on the training data. Loss functions may include a regularization term. We generally will want a method that will perform well on our training data and reasonably well or well in our testing data. So popular optimizations are based on variants of the gradient descent methods, which follow the, the direction of the steepest descent in the negative gradient. And other theoretical developments exist to propose other forms to optimize the network. So I've mentioned uh, regularization. Regularization is a central problem in machine learning. That is, we need to make our algorithm or method robust so that it performs well, not just on the training data, but also on input. That is, we need to avoid overfitting. Data augmentation is a popular method to obtain a regularized network. We may also impose a penalty on our weights as shown in the previous slide. So we may think of introducing an L1 norm as a penalty or L2 norm, or we may think of a combination of both. There are also other forms of regularization. Dropout is one of them, which is shown in the picture. We remove some non-output units randomly at training time to improve convergence. This forces the network to have a regenton representation and can be seen as training and evaluating an ensemble of many neural networks that share parameters. Batch normalization is another problem. We whiten or normalize the layer inputs batch-wise. This avoids a small change made during the back propagation step within a given layer to produce a huge variation of the inputs of another layer. This improve the, improves the gradient flow through the networks and allows for higher learning rates and reduce the strong dependence on initialization. So which are the aspects that we need to take into account while working with deep learning methods? Well, data aspects are very important. We may need to process our data because otherwise the problem may become very hard to, to optimize. We do not want one of the dimensions or features to dominate over the others, because otherwise a given feature may be learned faster. One way to uh, make our uh, network more robust is by artificially creating more data if we cannot collect more data. This is called data augmentation and allows us to, to overcome the semantic gap. So uh, there are a few ways to do this, like uh, randomly cropping the image uh, or performing geometrical tra uh, transformations to the image. This allows to, to overcome the semantic gap. It is interesting to know that given uh, enough data, uh, a network can um, generally is better than a more complex model. Otherwise, uh, there are other uh, approaches to, to, to make the network more robust, like pretext pre tasks, which allow the model to learn useful features about the inputs to perform a given task. We also need, need to take into account that we need to set the hyperparameters. Hyperparameters like the learning rate or the weight decay are not optimized or learned. They must be set ahead and they are very problem dependent. We must try out them and see what works best. We've got also uh, waiting initialization aspects. The first idea might, might be to use small random numbers, which might be okay for small networks, but problems start with deeper networks. All activations may become radically zero or gradients will become zero at some point. 
So why such strategies have been proposed in literature? And finally, we need to take into account hardware aspects. To perform deep learning tasks at reasonable speed or time scale, we use GPUs, which were not intended for data science, but for video gaming where, when they were conceived. But some smart people realized that the parallel computing power they offered allowed to perform the millions of operations deep learning architectures require very efficiently. So let's move on to the next part about deep learning based segmentation tasks. <laughs> 